All right. What's up, everybody? We are back in the Spotburn studio. It's been a little bit, a little hiatus, but we're here. Episode nine. You got Dan and Mr. Bam Bam. Back. To, we got the band back together. It happened. We took a little break. Uh, Josh has been on a bit of a guide bender. We're going to talk about that a little bit. This is the point of the season where things start to really ramp up, get crazy. If he's not taking people out, he's probably fishing on his own. Um, I just had a kid. Well, not technically. That was Jen did all the heavy lifting. Uh, but Jen and I had a kid uh, July 29th. Miss Lucy Elizabeth was born. So we are, it's our first. We're pretty excited about it. Uh, it's also everything everyone talked about. Crazy. You don't sleep just a lot of eating and pooping and sleeping for 30 minutes at a time you kind of get into a weird dream state but it's been uh it's been awesome everybody's healthy everybody's alive everybody's excited to get out fishing this fall hopefully a little bit i know jen has been the one that kind of took the brunt of that as it goes with having babies us guys do pretty much nothing um at least <laughs> at the front end of the process it is crazy how that works it's just we it it shouldn't it shouldn't work that way. They should be a little bit more evened out, but unfortunately the uh the female species has the uh has that one. They take care of all the business there. You just kind of sit back and hope they're well fed and have a comfy pillow. That's about all you can do. <laughs> um but we tried to sneak one in before the baby came and that did not happen. But what we did get was um everybody sent us a bunch of awesome questions so we have a long list of questions we're not going to get through all of them but we picked out some of the best 10 i think we might have 11 one might have snuck in at the end um all musky fly fishing related um various topics we're gonna we're gonna go one by one and try and knock those out we think it's gonna make for a pretty fun episode so hopefully you enjoy as always thanks for tuning in helping support the musky fool dream uh, we we really do appreciate it, and we hope you like what we're putting out. Really quickly, let's take a little break and talk about our sponsors. We got Stealthcraft Boats out of Baldwin, Michigan. It sure would be a lot harder to musky fish on the rivers without Stealthcraft Boats. So we are grateful for what they do, for what they make. Um, we've been going on three years now of low water. Uh, we would probably be in a little bit of, it'd be difficult if we didn't have our hooligan rafts, just to name one of the, the few that we like. We've been putting those through the paces, and they kind of have become an essential tool for uh, for what we do up here in Wisconsin. But that's not where they end. They got drift boats, inflatables, all sorts of sizes, motors, no motors, skiff style, big rockers, jet boats, mod Vs, you name it. Go check them out. Now's a great time to get an order in if you want something new for next year. So Stealthcraft Boats and Cortland Line Company. Uh, these guys make awesome, innovative musky lines. They make lines for conventional fishing and the salt, uh, fly fishing of all sorts, leader material, tippet, you name it. I really like the musky tapers that um, we helped put together with them a couple of years back as we get into those colder months. At the end of the year, August, September, October, November, December, that's when those really start to shine. So getting excited to, to break some of those out. One product I do want to call out, though, that I have personally liked, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to play with it, Josh, is their new fluorocarbon XTR, new fluorocarbon leader material, super stiff, uh, smooth, it's got great knots, tying ability, super durable, abrasion resistant. I know I sound like I'm just speaking all the marketing speak, but I genuinely think it's a really good product. It's not cheap, but... We're talking about the business end of our musky fly leaders. We don't want to skimp. Um, so fluorocarbon XTR, pretty good. Go check it out. All right, current events. Current events. Well, other than the main current event for me, uh, having a child, uh, what have you been up to, Josh? It's you've been you've been a little busy over there. Yep, that's correct, Dan. I've been on the water quite a bit lately. With a, a fun smallmouth season about to come to a close here, it's been it's been a challenging year with all the low water, a lot of uh, really clear water conditions. So they haven't been as aggressive as years past, but we've been we've been finding a lot of great fish this season. Um, we had a couple of successful musky outings recently. Had some folks 
from Vermont that were in uh, the jet boat for the day, and we were able to bag a couple muskies. So they had a blast on that trip as well. Uh, kind of a quick, fun guide story from last week. I had a gentleman and a dog in my raft, and the dog's name was also Bam Bam. So what? that was that was super super fun. She and you was didn't a, know that going in; it was just a surprise, total surprise. Yeah, wow. he introduced her, and it was it was fate that brought us together. She was an absolute queen in the boat. She sat in the the front seat all day and didn't make a peep at all. It was awesome. The she Bam Bam too. It's the it's the Alpha and Omega of Bam Bams. Yep. Yep. Uh, so what kind of dog? She was a Portuguese water dog. So apparently they were used a lot in uh, water applications. So they were like a, a water working dog. Uh, so they would like travel messages between boats back in the day. You know, they would retrieve things a lot. So they're used to being in the boat and being around water all day. So she was awesome. So that's that's good. That did she fish at all or she just hang out and eat snacks? I couldn't get her to double haul. So unfortunately <laughs> I was like, sorry, buddy, you just gotta sit and watch for today. Yeah, that's rough. But now we know when you get reincarnated as a four-legged dog, you'll come back as a female Portuguese <laughs> water dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I hope so. It looked like a pretty awesome life, I'll tell you that. Yeah, right. What yep. else has been going on, dude? Um, so you're just about to wrap up smallmouth season. That's pretty typical for us up here in Wisconsin. September, usually, I don't know about way up north, but down here, mid-September is when... Uh, I it, I genuinely, it would be hard for me to say that smallmouth fishing gets worse. I just don't smallmouth fish in September. I think that's when the muskie clock really starts to tick. You get excited and you really only have so many more chances before the season's over but for the most part it's you know in the river systems it just the fishing kind of falls off right as far as the smallmouth go yeah it seems like they tend to want to retreat either back to a lake or up under a dam and like you said dan the musky fishing starts to get better and everyone you can you can just feel it in the air so yeah it's hard it's to kind of like go it's kind of like if you if you reach out and you want to go on a smallmouth guide trip with us in september and october don't be surprised if we tell you no because that's not what we want to do that's not what we want to <laughs> show you guys it's musky time yeah that's it does smell like it in the air it doesn't smell like it right now because i think it's going to be 100 degrees tomorrow but yeah. we're not in september yet we're recording this in august so we still got a little time um what else is happening uh we well last time we recorded we were talking about the i think it was about to be the madison pmtt the second qualifier which gabe and i fished in with fly rods news flash we did not win we did not catch a muskie um we had a pretty good day saturday we had our chances uh but it was i think the overall was pretty crazy to see the the size of fish that came out of madison you know we've known it fishing here for a while but i think to be able to have the musky world descend on Madison and see what kind of fishery we have was pretty exciting. The biggest fish was, oh, I think 53 and three quarters. Um, three monsters over 45 were all caught within an hour of each other to win. The winners got three on the last day, so that was pretty cool. Um, but they didn't come to play. We had some, like I said, we had some movement. We had some love on Saturday. I had a dragon tail completely ripped off of my fly right at the boat. That was a little bit of a heartbreak. Then oh. the pattern totally switched Sunday. It was just, it was a little rough out there for fly casting. I mean, three foot, three foot rollers. You needed the big boat. Uh, we, we partied as long as we could, but it just, it just wasn't happening. So fun tournament though. It was fun to kind of get the cobwebs off and, and get after it and see what that whole musky tournament circuit is about. We will be back. That's for sure. Hopefully we get Bam Bam in the mix next time. Uh, they were just up at Vermilion this weekend, um, which was kind of always cool to see the results come in. Bigger fish caught in Madison uh, than they were in Vermilion, which I don't think uh, if you were betting on that, you would have you would have taken the Madison bet there. But um, probably just an outlier weekend for Vermilion. But really cool. I, I'm, I just like paying attention to it. Like with all tournaments we've talked about, you either catch a fish or you learn something. So... 
And then speaking of tournaments, we have the official fly fishing musky tournament circuit kind of, it's not really a circuit. I just, there's two of them and they both happen around the same time. Josh was out, uh, the one out east, beast of the east last year, which we helped sponsor. Those guys put on an awesome tournament for muskies Inc. Um, they are full. I believe they, they filled up in two weeks, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. All 32 boats, two weeks filled up, maxed out. No, uh, there's a wait list of six or seven boats, I believe. But if you're going to check that one out, that one is first weekend of October. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it on future podcasts. Um, maybe get some of those folks, maybe do a little tournament recap since the beast and tree lands, which is the second tournament, uh, last weekend of September here in Wisconsin. Um, they're a week apart. First time they've been on separate weekends. I believe I do know there are a couple brave souls who are fishing both of them, which was hopefully one day we'll get to do that. I know that was kind of the intent of getting those tournaments to separate those so that people could potentially fish both because there's not a whole lot of musky fly fishermen out there. And uh, I know we both want to get to those events, but you're coming back to Treelands this year, right, boss? Yes, yeah, sir. We missed and, you last year. Yeah, I know. I was sad. I wasn't there, but I was out east making a whole mess of new friends and and seeing what nice. that whole tournament scene was about out there. Yeah, it's it's quite different than Treelands, but it's amazing in its own right. You know, I highly encourage everyone if they ever have the opportunity to fish both of them. Um, just it's just a whole different ball game out there. A lot of what fun. were some of what were some of the big difference? I mean, I know the main big difference is tree lands is it feels almost like an overwhelming amount of water that's in bounds. Some of that's the nature of northern Wisconsin and muskies. There's musky water everywhere, whereas Beast kind of has a lake and a river. Any other uh, big fun weird differences? Correct. Yeah, that was the the biggest difference that I noticed. Tree lands. It's like, where do you even start? How how do you even remotely decide where you want to fish you know there's so much water and it all comes down to strategy like the farther you travel the harder it is to get back in time for weigh in or, or sorry not oh. weigh in check in <laughs> yeah we don't weigh our muskies uh but uh yeah like the the musky recording system is different out there like the way you check in fish so it's just it's fun to see how different tournaments are doing things slightly yes. differently yeah yeah it's also i'm not complaining by any means but it is like what was fun about the pmtt in madison and what i would imagine is fun about a tournament like beast is you really get a sample of a watershed for a weekend because everybody pretty much has to fish the same spot whereas in treelands you just you're so spread out you know this lake went off but that one didn't this river had like it's just you don't really get an idea of uh what was really happening you know if fish were biting obviously there's usually some windows um mm -hmm. which do somewhat remain consistent across water bodies but tree lands i feel like is more like was it the rivers that were going off or was it the lakes that were going off and plural because there's so many options regardless the... go ahead reg regardless of which tournament you're fishing you just want to uh feed the winning team as many shots of booze at the end of the, the tournament as possible. So they give up all their secrets of where they were fishing. That is the goal. That is the goal. And also, I, I don't know. I feel like that should be part of it. That was what was maybe cool about going to the PMTT and seeing the conventional side. They share willingly. So like the first night, all the teams that are in the top 10 come up on the mic and they're like, what were you doing? You know, and, and it's a, the first night is definitely a little cagey. Like you can tell the tournament director isn't like asking them for the details, but then after the second day, when the tournament's over, it's like, all right, cough it up. Like, where were you? You know, we were on the, on Monona, on rocks, fishing rubber, uh, black. And like, you kind of get to like, hear all of that, which at Treelands, I feel like everybody's looking around, like, I hope they don't ask me where I got those fish. It's like, mm. oh, I'm going to find you. I'm going to find you. And Josh is going to feed you tequila until you tell us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly <laughs> all right one more uh current event before we get into the main event um josh do you want to do you want to talk about this one sure i can talk about this one 
you were the you were the one that suggested it. It's a good it's a good one. It's a good update. Uh yes, sir. So it's called Real Recovery, folks, which is a national nonprofit organization that uh, conducts fly fishing retreats for men living with all forms of cancer. So folks out there that are are battling with cancer, this is a tremendous opportunity for them to have all expenses paid on these retreats, get out on the water, catch some fish and meet a lot of great people. Um, we're having one up in Eau Claire in early September. So that retreat starts at 4 p.m. Wednesday, September 6th, and it ends on the 8th, which is a Friday. So if you know anybody that would uh, potentially be interested in, in those retreats, go check them out on the interwebs and uh, get signed up as soon as you can. Yeah, it looks like an awesome, awesome event. Meals, lodging, equipment, all re in included. No previous fishing experience required. Maximum of 12 people, 12 men invited to participate. So definitely uh, go check it out. Or if you know someone that would uh, could use could use a little real recovery, be sure to share. That is September 6th through September 8th. We will post a link to the uh application on the podcast notes all right main event time without further ado let's get after it this is the musky q a one uh we got all sorts of good questions from you guys and gals we appreciate it keep sending them our way we love to hear from you we love that some of the questions are hilarious some of them are extremely appropriate we feel some of your pain deeply it's it's part of how it goes but we're going to get into them and we're going to try and move through them quickly because I've been told that I can talk far too long on these podcasts. Um, we're already a few minutes in and we want to want to cover some of these. So number one, this was uh, a lake fishing question. What habitat do you look for when fishing muskies in lakes, depth and structure? That is a very good one. Um, I mean, we've we've talked about this a little bit here, I think. Sometimes fishing lakes, especially for muskies with a fly rod, it can feel like you are out in the middle of the ocean. You have to feel, figure out what's under the surface. It's not as apparent to the eye as when you're fishing a river and you can see seam lines and current and depth and trees sticking out of the water. So a, a lot of this answer, especially like what habitat to look for, I think, I, I won't be able to answer every piece of that right now. We probably would need an entire podcast for that. I mean, there's books written about it because you have so much, so many different watersheds, right? You have big, clear, you know, Northern Minnesota or, you know, Canadian lakes. You have lakes that are primary rock. You have lakes that have sand and gravel and hard bottoms and soft bottoms. Then you have stuff you know, that's super shallow and weedy. Uh, you have stained water, clear water. Some of it's got creeks coming into it. Some of it is just a total drainage lake. You have flowages. So I don't mean to wax too much on that, but lots of differences. And I think those differences do matter. You know, if we're going to look at what habitat I look for here in the Madison chain, it's weeds it's weeds related are they in the in the weeds are they on the edge of the weeds are they a few casts off the weeds are they following schools or are you know but it's primarily weeds um so it can somewhat make it easy because it reduces it down to one but then can also make it a challenge because there's weeds everywhere you know and that's when you're looking at weeds i think just to go deep on that for a second the type of weed matters so much. I mean, we, we don't get a lot of cabbage down here in Southern Wisconsin, mainly milfoil, but like up in Northern Wisconsin, um, on the, some of the lakes, I know you and I fish, like we're looking for cabbage, you know, and that's a specific type of big broad leaf, um, you know, that you'll see, you got red cabbage. That's kind of the, the favorite in the musky world. Um, and that's just, it attracts bait fish. It attracts, which attract muskies. Um, you know, and, and then you just have to kind of play, pick that apart, casting over the cabbage, excuse me, casting onto the edge of it. You know, I think this is, this is the trick of lake fishing, especially when you're going in blind is where are they right now? Um, you know, and there's not really a, 
a great way to figure that out. This is when electronics come into play. So, you know, let's just say, I guess uh, another way to think about this, because this I think is meant to be a, a bigger question that we'll spend a little bit of time on, but let's just say I'm going to a lake I've never been on. You and I are going to do this in a couple of weeks. And for the sake of this conversation, we'll just say there's all sorts of structure. There's a deep woody uh, shoreline. There's some mid rock bars. There's some weed edges. There's a bay with a creek mouth in it. You have the deep basin. You know, we're going to probably spend the first hour or two driving around, you know, and honestly, before that, we're going to spend time looking at the maps and being like, hey, this looks like a good spot. This looks like a good spot. Let's check this out. And then we're going to get out there and probably drive around with the electronics. And that's where electronics do help is it just, okay, now we've figured out there's a weed edge at 10 feet and you can kind of see that. And then, oh man, we marked a little bit of bait right there. And then we drive over to the different type of structure, the rocks, and it's, there's nothing there, you know? And then we, we go into the wood structure and we maybe see a couple muskies on side imaging or we don't. So you're kind of, you have to use that to your advantage. Um, and then all of that can change time of year. You know, if you look at what habitat and structure and depth are we looking for muskies in in spring, we're typically pretty shallow in bays that receive a lot of the sunlight that warm up the fastest and, um, you know, have some sort of weeds. Now, those weeds aren't going to be there. They're going to be there later in summer, but that spot is what's going to attract them to spawn. So it's a really good question. I don't know that I feel like I can do it justice right now. Maybe it's something that we expound upon and make its own episode out of, but I would say, you know, for someone looking to answer that question at any given point, the thing that I would recommend above all else is drive around, you know, and it's going to feel like you're burning time, not casting, but casting at nothing is way better than driving around and learning a couple things. And I'm always surprised whenever I take the time to drive around, I figure something out, you know, even when I drive around and I see nothing on my electronics, I kind of have two guesses at that point. It's like, well, they're probably buried in the weeds or they're out in the middle of the structure at the bottom. Um, so that driving around just helps so much. Um, I guess to, because I feel like I'm not answering this question at all to help a little bit as we head now into late August, early September, mid September on the lakes, I think we get excited about that period. Cause usually, um, especially on some of the lakes we fish in, nor in northern Wisconsin and southern Wisconsin, there is a, a pretty good rush of fish that go shallow. You know, you, you start to see the weeds dying off. Um, so I'm looking for like the most alive weeds that are out there still. If they're super dead on one section of the lake, but they're still kind of alive on one, you know, the other, I might focus on the section where they're more alive and I'm expecting there to be a rush shallow. But really any given day I'm on a lake, I am looking at electronics, you know, if I know the lake super well and I'm in my spot that I think is good and nothing's really happening, I'll maybe go out deeper. I'll maybe drive around a little bit. So I think fishing with that mindset that you really have to put the puzzle together on your own and, and use the boat to your advantage, drive around, burn some gas, find some spots, look at your electronics. I, I just personally find that to be way more effective than casting it, you know, what looks like a good spot that I've never fished before. It, it, it just, the odds are too stacked against us. So I, I kind of rambled on that one, Josh, I do get excited about that topic. And like I said, a couple of times now, we'll have to probably revisit that and kind of organize our thoughts and maybe help layer that out season by season, you know, type of water body by type of water body. But, um, that's that's what I would add. What about anything on your end that I kind of missed? I'm trying to keep it 30,000 feet without spending the whole podcast on that one question. Yeah. I don't know what what more I would add to that without beating a dead horse that this uh, smaller framework we have on this topic today. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm if I'm going to a new lake and I don't have time to drive around and I just want to start fishing, I'm just going to start finding, like you said, 
contours and weeds. That's always been my big go-to. Yep. I think keep that in mind too. You're talking to two folks that generally fish Wisconsin water. So the game does change a little bit as the lakes get deeper and clear and you have Cisco fed stuff happening up in Northern Minnesota. Um, But I guess the last thing I'd end on with that one is like, don't hesitate to reach out. A lot of people reach out to us. And I think that situational, situational context, like here's what I'm doing. Here's what type of year I'm doing. We can help point you in the right direction based on some of that, those inputs. Um, There's also a couple really good, you know, whether it's books or um, things like Jeff Van Remortel's Muskie Academy that kind of tries to break this down in a lot more detail. Um, Pretty exhaustive type of water body, time of season. I think those type of water body and time of season are definitely the variables you want to hone in on and not just take somebody's lake fishing advice boilerplate that person could be fishing an entirely different type of body of water entirely different type of musky might not apply to what you're trying to do um that being said i guess again maybe to be be dead a little bit but if i'm fishing you know if you're like just give me a boilerplate answer i'm probably uh seven to 15 feet casting at weed edges somebody casting at the weed edge somebody casting off the weed edge is like generally you're not going to be too far off with that but again i think there's too many variables there to give you uh, an exact answer moving on i think we we hit that one joshua what uh we got question number two favorite type of boat boxes and what's in them yeah sir so The key features you want in a good boat box are it's going to be waterproof. You can easily access your tools and all of your gear and you can modify them. A lot of them are modular. Some of them have little pouches that come in and out that are waterproof. Some of them are more like containers that you can drop in and out and move around. And some of them have those dividers with Velcro on the side. So as your workflow in the boat uh, evolves, you can kind of change your boat box to fit all of those. Um, I like, I personally like the ones that have like a, a giant pouch so I can keep all of my musky surgical tools at the ready. So when we get one in the net, I can quickly grab, you know, the long nose pliers, um, maybe a nip X if I really had to, and some other tools like a jaw spreader and stuff like that. Um, I have one that has removable waterproof bags, which is super handy for putting like your cell phone and your keys in. Mm -hmm. And you always know where it's going to be because the worst thing in the world is you get done with a a 10 or 12 hour float and uh, somebody can't find their keys and now you're hitchhiking. So that's what I'm looking for. As far as what I have to you, Josh. (laughs) Yes, it's happened three times to me (laughs) and it's. Some of them have been really easy outcomes and some of them have been character building experiences and I'll leave it at that. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, you, could, you could almost do like a, uh, grab someone's boat box and pick it apart and just like pull, what, what are we going to find in Josh's boat box today? It's like, ah, oh, oh, we yeah. have a bagel from last season. Um, well, we have- <laughs> I, I will say, yeah, there's all sorts of treasures. Nick Gellerstadt, while we were launching boats the other day, he caught a crayfish and put it inside of my leader and tippet bag. <laughs> and I didn't find it until like one o'clock in the afternoon. When <laughs> I reached in there to grab more uh, fluorocarbon butt section and this, <laughs> this crayfish <laughs> crawled out of nowhere and I could hear him laughing from the other boat. Oh, um, but yeah, in my boat box, I have all of my tools uh, to get uh, hooks out of fish's mouths. I have a a pretty comprehensive first aid kit that includes all sorts of medicines, uh, bandages, a lot of common stuff that you use through the day, and then more catastrophic tools that hopefully I'll never have to dive into. I usually keep like a rain jacket, maybe an extra one in case somebody forgets it, an extra pair of sunglasses in there, and then, you know, all your terminal tackles. So we've got swivels, hooks leader material bite wire you know everything that we're going to encounter on the river we want to be prepared for is in that boat box yep nothing really different over here we got maybe like a headlamp 
Um, I mean, you named it all. I mean, it's it's kind of try, I, at least I think the thing I try to do is get everything but flies in there. So it's like I got flies, I got boat box. There's no other place for anything to be. You know, I'm putting my phone, my my wallet, all that in the boat box. As far yep. as like some, maybe a direction I can take this because you you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, as far as like our favorites go, um, I mean, you really have five five to six styles you have like sims makes a boat box a waterproof one and a non-waterproof one fish pond makes a boat box and then they also make kind of like a, a what would you call it like a roll top boat box umqua makes one patagonia makes one and then you got i think some folks use like those yeti loadout boxes as well um, yeah. all have their pluses and minuses all have certain features that some don't um i think the fish pond and sims ones we sell the most here at the shop we're big fans of those um and i usually like the bigger ones the bigger the better you're going to use all the space we got big tools you know maybe um i'm going to have like a couple extra reels in there and then it's not jammed and it's and it's organized by the end of a trip by the end of a season it definitely becomes a disorganized mess but at least when you start the season out everything has its place um, yep i've also this season i don't know why i didn't do this earlier is such an easy and obvious fix in hindsight but i bought some like two or three of those little tackle organizers just those like plastic they're not planos but they're like mini planos uh-huh. And that's been great because then I just have, I'm not like futzing around with all sorts of different plastic bags and things that are spilling all over the place. I got one that's all split rings, stay locks, fast hatches, naughty toys like, you know, egg sinkers and a UV light. And then I got a whole other one that's just hooks, extra hooks, different size hooks. So keeps it somewhat organized i've remained more organized this year than i have in the past so i like i like those as well and then those kind of stack inside of my boat box which is super nice yep boat boxes i think we hit that one well i actually it's funny that you i'm glad you answered the question because i read it over here and i've read it several times and i in my head was thinking fly boxes the whole time and then you started talking and i was like oh yeah that's it's a boat box oh uh, yeah yeah, I hope that's what that person was referring to. They said boat boxes. I would I would imagine they would have said fly boxes if they wanted to talk about fly boxes. Um, yeah. Number three. Is it really hard or do I just suck at fishing? Moment of silence. Do you want me to try that one? You know? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> well, the learning curve is certainly harder than traditional gear like that's just being get, nice you suck uh, go ahead go yeah, ahead <laughs> yeah the lear the learning curve that can be very frustrating at first especially when you have other variables at play like you have all these intentions of doing a fantastic top water day on your favorite lake and now there's 35 mile an hour wind gusts and you're operating a trolling motor and also trying to double haul a fly line and keep that from not getting tangled in everything. So in that regard, it can be extremely, extremely challenging. Yeah, and, I, I agree. Yeah. And like, you know, they say muskies are the fish of 10,000 casts. Well, if one out of every 10 of your casts is good and the other nine suck, you're actually casting like a million times to get 10,000 really good casts out there. So uh, that can be very challenging while you're learning how to cast these bigger flies and, and cast those bigger lines. But I mean, muskies, they are what they are. They're really difficult no matter way you, or no matter which way you, you uh, cut the mustard there. So yeah. to be, do, to be doing it with fly rods while you're trying to learn all of these new techniques that can add to the frustrations. I think you, I mean, I, I kind of go back to the tournaments we talked about too. Those are always good kind of moments of clarity. You know, you had a hundred boats in Madison, all extremely good anglers. They know where muskies are. They can catch them. They have caught many before. And I think there was 13 caught the first day. 
So it's, it's, mm. that's, that's like the toughest part. And I think we'll, we'll hopefully be able to talk some more about that in the future. Like the mental, the mental game is like, you're constantly teetering between like, am I doing something wrong or just keep doing it? You, you know, you haven't done it enough. And there's not a lot of feedback in between to be like, yeah, that's wrong. Or just you, you were one cast away from glory. So yep. I don't know. I, it's hard and we suck. It's both like it's, it's, we've all probably felt this. Every one of us that I fished with, part of musky fool any good musky fly angler any musk like there's a moment in your fishing lifetime and probably a moment in every season where you're just like i suck might even be a moment within every day where you're just like i suck mm -hmm. you know i know i have some of those where you just you just like you haven't seen anything you make a shitty cast and you're just like this i suck i am terrible at this this is not gonna happen and i think I don't know. It's what keeps me coming back a little bit because it truly is like it is chasing a, a unicorn. You know, can you do the right thing over and over and over again and then also get lucky? Yep. The most important the most important thing, though, is you just you can't take it too seriously where you get really beat down and frustrated and, and you want to give up is when you're taking it too seriously and you just have to remember you know, this is fishing. It's supposed to be fun. I'm out with my friends. I'm out on my favorite body of water. And if you just, you have that mindset, you'll be able to stay in the game longer and then catching muskies will just naturally come. So yeah, just don't take this whole carnival game too seriously. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. And I think two other things. I mean, like, I'm just thinking of one time this season where I think I might have even called you or texted you and it was just like, I'm terrible at this, Josh. Cause it was like, I was like a week of like, oh, I'm on him. I'm on him. I'm on him. I'm on him. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. And I trout set this one. Mm. And you're just like, how, how? You All you've been thinking about all week was what you're going to do. You've been practicing it over and over again with all your casts and you get one chance at a really nice one and you trout set it. Like you sit here on this podcast and in this shop and tell people not to trout set it. And then that's what goes through your brain. Like your, my brain has just started eating itself. It was like, you're terrible. Stop it. Go, go quit fishing. And you just kind of have to, as Josh said, pinch yourself, realize this isn't, don't take it too seriously. I think the thing that definitely hurts this and makes it harder this in this day and age is social media. Because it does, you can you can end a shitty day and pull up your phone and be like, oh, well, they caught one. They they caught a fifty six. They caught six. They had they had, you know. And it just, it's not really helpful because it's all situationally different. And there is anybody that says otherwise, I think, is full of shit. There's so much luck involved too. You got to do all the right things and then get lucky. And there's just something about it. There's something every year it seems like you can kind of see somebody get on a hot streak and then it kind of dissipates. But like for that given year, it was like somebody's year and then it's not their year next year. Yep. And it just, it it's that amorphous. It's, it's not, it's not as repeatable as it seems on social media. There's a lot of in between time where they're not catching them just like the rest of us. So hopefully that helps whoever that was that submitted that it's tough. It should be fun. All you can really do is get back up and keep casting because there's no there's no secret. That's really it. Number four. This should be a quick one. Can I cut my bite wire with my nippers or will I ruin them? <laughs> uh, well, you're probably going to ruin them. Would Like, they're going to work for a little bit and then your nice fancy hatch nippers are going to be ruined. I, I would uh, I would highly recommend against that. Um, man, I think you might even if you keep cutting a hundred pound fluorocarbon, you might ruin them eventually, or at least at least need new, uh, you know, need new parts to replace them. But I highly recommend an actual wire cutter. We've talked about it a lot on the podcast. Nipex is one of our favorites because it not only cuts your leader wire, it cuts shanks when you're tying 
at the fly at the vice it cuts hooks and it cuts them like butter and it keeps cutting them over and over and over again so josh do you uh, feel differently about that are you a wire nipper cutter over there burning through nippers yeah i feel like you can nail a nail in with the handle of a screwdriver but it's much easier to use a hammer you can do it but just go for a tool that it was intended for You heard the man. All right, number five. What rod weight covers the most situations for a newbie? We're going to keep this too musky fishing. Do um, you want to go first or do you want me to go first? You go first, Dan. Okay. I will say I think an 11 weight is what if you're going to if you're going to come and you're like, I want to get started. What should I get? I want to get a dedicated musky set up. I want it to be versatile. I will probably try to talk you into an 11 weight. And the reason I think so is that it just, it gives you a little bit of both worlds. It's, it's, it sounds really stupid, but it's bigger than a 10 weight and it's lighter than a 12 weight, which should be obvious. But I think when you actually use it on the water, I find that that is a good mix and you're not going to regret it. Um, I don't know that I have any other salient intellectual points on that, but I think 11 weight overall is probably my recommendation for an all around, you know, you can take it to big water. It works well on small water. It works for good on smaller fish, bigger fish. You, you're kind of, you're in the game no matter where you, where you are, but that's my take. Josh, what do you think? Yep. I'm pretty close with, with you, Dan. I would go with a 10 weight just for a couple other reasons. It's lighter than an 11 weight. It's heavier than a nine weight. Uh, yeah, it's just that slightly lighter rod. It, it's going to help you get through the learning curve of double hauling. So you're not being forced to load it up with these super high grain lines. So in that regard, like if you're if you're pretty strong or you're a big person or you know you're ultimately going to be fishing trophy waters sooner than later, probably go with the 11 weight. If you're fishing a lot of streams, like smaller rivers, smaller streams, and and overall the muskies you're, you're targeting are smaller, get a 10 weight, something like that. I also feel like 10 weights, like if you go to most fly shops, 10 weight lines are more readily available than 11 weight lines or something in that ballpark of grain weight as well. Yep. But you truly can't go wrong with a 10 or an 11 weight. Nine weight, eight or nine weight is probably a little too light. And 12 weight weight can just be a little bit too overwhelming when you're first starting out. Totally agree. And with 10s and 11s, they, despite the fact that we don't often recommend that you get a versatile fly rod when you're musky fishing, because the musky specific ones are that much better, 10s and 11 weights you can do other things with them, you know, whether you're pike fishing, redfish, you know, permit. Again, it's it's best to have the right tool for the job. But generally speaking, um, 10s and 11s are a little bit more versatile than like a 12 weight or a two handed rod or something like that. Uh, all right. Number six, I have been guiding clients for four days in a row, crab walking into a stiff sideways wind, and I have a brace on my wrist. What should I do now? Oh wait, that's not a that's not a question on the list. Uh, <laughs> what yeah. happened, Josh? I was gonna say I didn't see that question. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Holding holding a a raft in a sideways wind for four days in a row. I don't know. I thought I was in pretty good rowing shape, but apparently it was enough to tweak it, and I felt a pop uh, yesterday. Oh, no. And now I can't uh, turn my hand over, which is unfortunate because I have four days in a row uh, starting on Thursday. So time to get the trolling motor out. Yep. I'm going to do some time on the button pushing regime. And then I've just been doing some stretches I'm embracing it, of course, and icing it. And I'm trying to get that thing back in action as soon as possible. And I have not casted a fly rod for my own personal enjoyment in a month. So I'm just trying to like kind of uh, recoup a little bit right now. Well, we're going to get after it soon. I haven't casted a fly rod in a month either, but I have a good excuse. I'm sure you're jonesing over there. 
Yes, At least sir. it's your non-casting hand. It's your double hauling hand. Yep. That doesn't yeah. make it a ton better. Nope. So if you're wondering, if you're fishing with Josh over the weekend and you're wondering why he only wants to fish one side of the river, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's yep. only crab walking you one way, people. Oh, man. I I feel for you, man. I hope you get better soon. You better get better before September because it's time to go. But um, I did not think that I would also see you in a cast this year as an addition to me. I know. I think you're getting old, buddy. We're cast brothers, Dan. What the hell? Oh, man. All right. Number six, for real. When all else fails and you have been days or weeks without fish, what keeps you going? Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there. In the years past, I reflect. Uh, in years past, when I would take it too seriously, like I was like, I have to catch a muskie every time I go out. I would get so down on myself, and it was just horrible. You'd call up your buddies, and you're just like venting. But man, it you just can't take it too seriously. You got to be chill in Zen mode, and there the techniques used for that are. Go chase some other species, get that rod bent over for a day or two, and then come back to it with a, a fresh perspective and a fresh mindset. As you've we've talked about on the podcast, I tend to not do that, which makes it mentally way more challenging. But you are <laughs> right. There is like a Zen sweet spot where like you don't care too much, but care enough to, to do it right. Cause like I the thing that the thing that like put me over the edge one time was the like okay i don't care i don't care I, i'm gonna try not to care i'm gonna try not to care and then i fucked one up yeah and then just like you're such an idiot you suck at this back to sucking um i don't know that what keeps me going i mean i think i heard this once from someone a while ago and it was like most musky fishermen all they're doing is replaying previous eats in their head to keep themselves going like you're just you're just making a cast and replaying like that one time this happened that one time it followed that one time that one time that one time so that can keep you going if you don't have a lot of those um like josh said other fish help i don't know i think buddies help too like in in both ways like we can kind of bitch about the shitty fishing together and know that we both tried and then we can also like help pick each other back up a little bit it sounds a little mushy but it's like we're if you if you're going at musky fly fishing this community that does it musky fishermen i would say actually not just fly fishermen like we're all embracing in the suck a little bit so it's kind of leaning on that and like we all kind of wear it like a badge of honor so yeah some i think some people like it it's going to come for all of us. Right. I think, I think we all, we're either, we're either on a hot streak in a lull or somewhere in between when we're musky fishing. So you just have to kind of wait it out too. I think it might be a season. It might be a week, might be the next time you go out, but you just, you just got to wait it out a little bit and, and keep your head cool. I don't know. I don't know. I want, I, I could keep talking about that one. Cause that kind of hits a sweet spot of like mm, when the rubber hits the road and you're just not getting them. Yep. Some people quit. That that works too. Just sell your shit. Facebook marketplace, it, everything. It's different for everybody. I remember a specific story last year, Dan, you were going through some trials and tribulations. And instead yeah, of you, you videotaped my biggest trip, trial and tribulation. So I just replay it every time at night before <laughs> I go to bed. I know. Oh, it's, it's hard to watch <laughs> to this day, but yeah. Like instead of us going to chase smallmouth, we just went up to a lake that has a lot of little muskies in it. And sure enough, we boated a bunch that day and we had a blast and they were all probably oh, under we 30. Giggling. They were all under 30 inches and it was just what the doctor ordered to get us right back into it and, and all jacked up again for that, that fall. Oh, I remember push. That. Yeah. And that was, we were supposed to be pre-fishing for tree lands, but we went somewhere that was not in tree lands bounds. And then remember when we called Gabe, <laughs> we called yeah. Gabe on the water and he's like, yeah. what, what the fuck are you guys doing right now? 
<laughs> like, why are you there? And we're just like giggling. We're like, we've caught four. We're having fun. <laughs> and he was just, and we we were just in a musky paradise. Small musky paradise. We're going back there next weekend if things go south. If we if neither of us have casted in a month, maybe we should just go back there and just wipe them out. Yes, sir. Josh <laughs> loves that place. He he will never turn down a journey back to that place. All right. Number seven. Uh favorite line type to use. Favorite line type. Favorite fly line. What do you think, Josh? Intermediate fly line. Inter- intermediate. That's yeah, a pretty you, good answer. You can't go wrong. It it fits a lot of the gamut. You can fish poppers with it. You can fish heavier flies with it you can fish stuff that goes just subsurface it's a breeze Mm -hmm. to cast it's enjoyable to walk and wade with it's enjoyable Mm -hmm. to fish out of a boat with um yeah like if you're just throwing a floating line it can be frustrating when your deceivers aren't aren't sinking and so now you're anything if anything you can just cross off floating line and like sink eight sink ten those aren't yeah. making uh, those aren't making the list. What's up, Jordy? Come on the podcast, man. We got extra room. Jordy, Jordy's getting <laughs> a little antsy. He's like, yeah, you guys, it, he's our clock. When we when Jordy has to go out, we have to stop recording. That's how it works. When you first start out uh, trying musky fly fishing to see if you're interested or you just want to give it a go, you know, for like two or three years because you're on a budget, you're trying to cover this huge gamut with limited amounts of tools. So you want to start with a great all-around rod, like we talked about, a 10 or an 11. And same with your fly line. A, a good intermediate line will get the job done in all sorts of scenarios throughout the season. And so once you kind of get that dialed in and, and you're really interested in, in pursuing this longer, that's when you can get into more of those specialty lines, like floating lines for midsummer applications and then really deep sinking lines if you're fishing a big Cisco lake or you need to get in those deep ho- holes in the fall. Yep. Yep. I'm not going to say anything pretty much different than what you did. I mean, I would say if you are the representative river fisherman and I am the representative lake fisherman, I might pick a sink three or four as my go to. If I get one line to fish all year long, I'll probably pick that over an intermediate. But I think knowing that I'm using it on the lakes, you're using it on the rivers. So we're, we're kind of splitting hairs, but kind of in that intermediate to sink four range would be the most versatile favorite. And I think the question asked favorite, like those are the best to cast floating lines suck to cast when they're 450 grains. They're just super air resistant. And then the sinking, the deep, deep sinking lines can be super tough too. So, uh, I think that does it favorite line type. You heard it here. Um, I guess just in case we didn't answer that correctly, my favorite r- line brand, it does vary, but I, I mean, I'm, it's over here. Cortland has been my favorite line brand for a while. That's why I was pumped when we got him to come on and sponsor the podcast. So it was a little bit of like, I know I sound like I'm, uh, you know, pimping them because they're the podcast sponsor, but overall I do like their stuff. In the summertime, I think we do, I, I use a couple different other lines that are a little bit better in the hot, hot temperatures than the Cortland Pike musky. But just in case that's what you meant, I, th- I think you meant line type, not uh, line brand. All right. Shut up, Dan. Enough. Three more questions. Four more. The bonus round question. What are the key variables you consider when deciding fly color, size, depth, and retrieve? I mean, those are kind of the variables. I, I would say in if we're talking about what are the key variables I consider when thinking about a presentation, i.e. the fly, I will probably go in this order. Size, depth, profile Mm, i'm probably gonna go size speed depth profile and then way down the list color 
like in order of importance for me. Size and speed, that's what I'm probably tweaking the most within a cast, within a presentation. Depth, right behind it. Color, man, that's, I just want to look at something pretty. If if something really is happening where all day Josh is fishing black and I'm fishing white and I haven't seen a sniff, I'm going to ask myself first, is he fishing a bigger or smaller fly than me size? Is he fishing it faster or slower? Does he have long pauses or is he burning it back to the boat? Is he fishing it deeper or shallower? Is Or am I getting too deep and the muskies are looking up? Or am I too shallow and I'm not getting it down to them? And then if I do all those things and they're still only eating Josh's black fly, man, maybe then I'll switch to a black fly, but I really just don't think it matters all that much. What about you, Bamalam? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Depth, size, and speed is what it really boils down to. I don't I don't believe too much in the whole color hoopla and whatnot like that. Um but if the colors give you more confidence, I mean, there have been colors throughout the years that we've seen work better than others. Maybe it's because somebody caught one on a yellow fly. And so now we're all fishing yellows and bam, we're, we're starting to catch fish. Um, I, I think that you can make a decision based on conditions. Like if it's a dark day, maybe not use a fly that's completely full of flashaboo. Maybe go with something that's a little more subtle, something like that. But yeah, yeah it does. It, it does matter enough to be on the list. Like we both agree on that. Yeah. And we're both like, I think creatures, like the way the human brain works, there's something about color is always like, oh, that orange one you're using keeps getting bit and your brain is like the orange. It's the orange. It's the orange. And it's usually not usually the orange. It's usually something else. Yeah, it's a fact. But it's still like we we both do it. Like we'll, we'll we're we're always you know like oh that white one you were using that was good and it's like yeah, but yeah. it was a medium size thin profile deep running white fly. I personally, I personally don't like to fish dark flies. I love seeing my flies. Mm -hmm. I always got my pulse on how they're swimming, where they're at. I'll be able to easily see a follow or an eat wherever it is. Yep. But there's guys like I mean, I, I love a really cool looking fly, like a blended sucker with all sorts of different colors. It looks great, but I prefer like it doesn't matter to the fish, you know, some like color blocked white and black is probably like more effective because it stands out a little bit more. Do we need to take a Jordo break? Yeah, quick Jordo break. I'll be right back. Jordo break. All right. We'll be back after this Jordo break. Hey, one I, thing I do want to talk about really quick with color. I'm glad you brought that up with the solid versus like more blended colors. That is one thing we have seen consistently is when you have a, it's either a one color fly or it's just like a stark color break between the tail and the body and the head. Um, that seems to be extremely effective. More mm -hmm. so than like all these crazy blended colors that you've spent hours putting together. It's that stark contrast that might have a triggering effect on them. Agreed. The crazy color blended ones get more Instagram likes, but I think the color blocked ones get more musky likes. Yep. And what are we solving for? I guess that's up to the up to the user. All right. Keeper moving. Number nine, are rattles in flies productive? Do you use rattles? Pick me, Josh. Pick me. Dan, do you I don't do you use, use rattles. Rattles? No, I don't. I don't really. I don't I mean I've got some rattles and some flies. I think about it a little bit, but I don't know. I don't like on the spectrum of noise, you take like a silent bait or fly, and then you take a double ten showgirl bucktail. That rattle doesn't make any noise. It's still in the like silent realm. 
it just I don't I don't know I I just my brain can't compute that that matters that I'm gonna get bit because I have a little tiny glass bead rattle going back and forth. So I just for that reason they kind of suck to tie. It always screws up your where do you put them? Like yeah, I have thoughts on all these things and I have rattles and flies and I've thought through it. But I like generally if I zoom out, eh, not important to my process. Skip the rattles. And we yeah. sell rattles. What about you? I don't have a single fly that has a rattle in it. There's our answer, folks. There's our answer. Rattle lists. Maybe Josh and I would catch 10 times more muskies if we had rattles. I I don't know what to tell you. All right. Our last official question before we hit the bonus round. How and when do you change presentation? When do you speed it up versus slow it down? When do you go deeper versus shallower, et cetera? Hmm. Hmm. So I think, first of all, I, I, you're changing out. You got to give something a good shake. I, and what I mean by that is like, if I'm feeling confident about a spot or about a piece of structure, let's, let's at least say I've reduced the variable of where are muskies. I know where they kind of are. Now it's about getting them to bite. I am going to give a couple spots enough chances let's say i'm fishing uh we'll just keep high in the water column fast i'm going to do that enough times where i can be like wow that really nothing didn't see anything or i get a little bit of data out of it moved one before i change i'm not just changing like a crazy person on everything because it's hard to figure that out um and then you really got to read the fish which is sounds super easy to say, hard to do. Um, I think the the hardest read is when you get a follow and you should you have sped it up or slowed it down. I think the gear world tells us to always speed it up, but in the fly world, we know that we get eats by killing it and slowing it down and speeding it up. So you kind of have to figure that out. Is the fish really hot on it? and just can't commit and you need to kind of pull it away from them. Um, so you kind of have to read the fish that way. Depth is a little bit more easier. I usually start high and work my way down um, unless we're super late in the season and then we know we're down, but usually muskies look up. So you're going to, you know, come in contact with fish at some point. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I flip it over to you, Josh, and get your thoughts is this is why I love fishing solo. But this is probably, other than just like being in the boat with friends, the number one reason I love fishing with somebody because we can accomplish multiple things at once. You can fish fast. I can fish slow. You can fish deep. I can fish shallow. And you can fish off one side of the boat. I can fish off the other. And we, we just doubled the amount of data we're getting. So I think that is a, a reason that I do like that a lot, um, even though, you know, it's not always possible. Yep. What about you? What's your process? Well, I always tell folks when you're retrieving that fly, don't just get into the zone where it's the exact same rhythm over and over and over and over again. Every single cast, you have to be hunting that fly. So you're not just going through the motions. You're seeing what that fly is doing in the water. So like maybe do a couple, like three quick strips to get that thing to really walk the dog. And then just stall it out. So it's just hanging there. And now, you know, do a couple more quick strips, couple slow strips, erratically moving that that fly like it's a, a dying bait fish or a wounded bait fish. So really hunting that fly. That's pretty much my kind of my standard go-to for most of the day when I'm fishing. Now, if I do get feedback on a fish where I had one he followed my fly in while I was doing that. Maybe on the next one, I'm going to do that two-handed burn. See if that that speeding it up will trigger a bite. I've seen that happen a couple times, especially midsummer when you get a lethargic fish where they're just kind of curious about it. You make another pass on them and burn it past their face and they absolutely crush it. Yep. Things like and that. Like I'm thinking of 
that video that went around it got a little viral on the internet it was uh one of the guys we know via social media they they support the shop quite a bit um you know which one i'm talking about where you got that musky to eat and then it was just like fuck it like it was super slow um it, it was amazing because i think you talking about jim franklin no, it wasn't Jim. It was like Nick. It was a couple. Uh, I think it was like Nick Mellet or one of his buddies. Um, okay. I'll have to send it to you so you can see it and maybe post it on here. I mean, it, it it's like millions of views on the internet. It was a. It's funny because the comments were just um, crazy outlandish. It was like the entire musky world descended on this comment thread. And keep in mind, the guy got the fish to eat, and I think self admitted that he kind of trout set it. So he didn't end up with the fish in the bag, but the muskie ate the fly. And then you got all these people telling him how he should have got the muskie to eat the fly. And you're like, wait a minute. But mm. it did. The guy's like, ah, you should have sped it up. I was like, but he slowed it down and killed it. And that's when it ate. But it was it was a really good look. Why I liked it and why I've kept watching it is you get the I think the underlying the undertone of that whole thing, whether we're talking about speeding it up or whether we're talking about slowing it down and we're really talking about reading the fish and you get this like cat and mouse effect and it's figuring out what's that going to be today. Cause you could just see the fish, like as it stopped, it kind of lost interest and then it moved again and then it kind of perked up. And like, sometimes it's just those pulses of life. Other times I think depending on their mood, it's like what Josh is talking about speed 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 you know like i wasn't there but just hearing the reports of the vermilion pmtt it was like out of the top 10 teams i think nine or eight of them were all burning bucktails like clearly you know speed was what was pissing them off that day and mm -hmm. got them got them firing so it's it's definitely a variable it, there is no i don't think anyone knows the rule of thumb that's just black and white if this then that if they're following you one foot behind your fly speed it up if they're two feet behind your fly slow it down like it just doesn't it doesn't work out to be that easy wish it did sure wish it did but trial and error kind of that mixture i think of fishing experience and intuition meets luck like you draw upon all your experience and think about what you want to do in the moment but then you just have to pick one and hope that's the one they want so that's that's kind of part of the question and then like i said earlier time like if you fished a slow high up in the water column white fly for six hours and you haven't seen a fish like you should probably change if you know that there are fish there you should change something deeper faster um and it, I think one of the things that I see surprise a lot of fly anglers, especially, is when muskies are not eating slow things, they don't think that they will eat fast things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like not the case at all. Sometimes they're not even going to move on that slow thing. They they need it burned. Um, I think the air conditioner just turned on, so apologies for the background noise if you can hear it, but... It is hot here in Wisconsin. We're about to hit 100 degrees tomorrow, so we, we got AC. But that's really the top 10 questions we got. Josh, did we miss anything on that last one that you want to add? Otherwise, I, the, the the bonus round. I think you got it, Dano. Let's go to the bonus round. Bonus round. All right. This is not PG rated. This was user submitted. NSFW, baby. NSFW. So if you're uh, under the age of 17, this is when you should turn the podcast off. Uh, all right. So someone submitted this. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was actually kind of tough to decide. But the question was, fuck one, marry one, kill one. <laughs> <laughs> it feels we haven't we haven't gone this uh, this uh, crazy on the podcast yet, but we're doing it. We can edit it later. Fuck one, marry one, kill one. Oh, boy. Catching a topwater bass. Catching a muskie on opening day. Or catching a gorgeous brook trout. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm is right. Uh. Can the gorgeous brook trout also do other things than just be a trophy brook trout 
Like, is this brook? Can this brook trout have long, meaningful conversations? And you know, no. I think it's just it's just eye candy. Home. It's just purely eye candy, brook trout. Just it eye candy. Even, it doesn't even talk back to you. It doesn't even speak English. Just total eye candy. Okay. Well, I'm definitely effing the. Oh, well, should we? Should we? Should we? Oh yeah. Okay. You go. Are, you go. Are we Let actually go. going to answer this question? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, we have <laughs> okay. to answer it. I just have to make sure I have my answer before you impact my answer. Okay. Um. Man, I'm. I feel really bad about what my answer is going to be. Okay. But it's it's like I can't undecide it. So. At this juncture in my life, I I'm... think I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Okay. Good. <laughs> You're good. What, what were you about to say at this juncture in my at, life? At this juncture in my life, at this age, I'm effing the opening day muskie. What does the F stand for? <laughs> <laughs> Coitus, <laughs> love making. All right. The meaningful relationship. Yeah. One one night with the muskie, I'm <laughs> I'm gonna kill the gorgeous brook trout. Just because I don't want to you're gonna come marry up. the top water bass. I'm gonna marry the top water bass because she's always gonna be. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm not much different. The part that I felt the bad about is that I'm gonna also kill the gorgeous brook trout. <laughs> <It's just> like <laughs> like the native. most sensitive native species we have in Wisconsin that is definitely on the decline, and we're both just gonna kill it. So, I I, I apologize, but I think. The only thing that I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it around. I'm gonna marry your sloppy seconds, and you're gonna marry my sloppy seconds because I'm gonna marry the opening day musky. If I could marry um, opening day musky every every time for the rest of life, done, <laughs> married, fucking wife and kids, like house in the suburbs, I'm set. Top water bass, like I I just need to do that once in a while. <laughs> 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 well played dano well played that's all we got before we get this one canceled uh that's a wrap folks you got the musky q a from josh and dan this is episode nine of the spot burn podcast we appreciate the support don't forget to like subscribe keep sending us your thoughts until next time though thanks guys thank you for listening to the spot burn podcast Coming to you from the dungeon, this podcast is presented by Musky Fool Fly Fishing Co. We want to thank our awesome sponsors, Cortland Line Company and Stealth Craft Boats. We also want to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in, subscribing, sharing, and spreading the good word. If you haven't heard, go check us out at muskyfool.com. Have fun out there on the water, y'all. <laughs>